Hi everyone, in an era where AI makes life-changing decisions, the fairness and morality of these systems is critical. AI's decisions, marred by spurious correlations and biases, can lead to issues like gendered facial recognition errors and unfair judicial algorithms. Imagine the profound impact of these flawed decisions on our everyday lives. Keep watching as we dive into the world of AI decision-making, exploring the path towards a future with more transparent and trustworthy AI systems. This video has three Parts. How does AI make decisions, explainable decision making, and achieving more trustworthy AI? Part 1. How does AI make decisions? AI makes decisions based on what was in its training data. However, in any given set of training data, there are going to be lots of false correlations. Correlations that don't imply causation. Take an example of an AI trained to recognize objects in images. If you trained that AI on lots of pictures of dogs, it might learn that if something has two black dots, then those are the eyes. So two black dots means it's a dog. And then when you start showing this model pictures of muffins, you might find a picture of a muffin with two black raisins in it, and that will immediately be declared to be a dog. That's also an example of a training set that doesn't actually have representative data, right? There weren't enough pictures of muffins. But even if you added tons of pictures of muffins, the model might still learn this false correlation. It might mispredict frequently on muffins, but not frequently enough to cause it to unlearn that association. Let's take another example. Suppose you're trying to get a model to predict car accidents. And suppose in the training data that drivers of Toyotas end up in more accidents in the winter than average. They get stuck in the snow, they slip on ice, whatever. And remember, this is a hypothetical example, nothing against Toyotas. However, in the training data, there's almost no instances of Teslas getting into car accidents in the winter. The model might conclude that if you drive a Toyota, you're at greater risk of these types of accidents. But maybe everyone who was driving a Toyota was living in Canada, while everyone who was driving a Tesla was living in Mexico. So you're not going to get into a lot of accidents where you slip on ice in Mexico. So this is the type of false correlation that a model might have learned. That's why correlation does not imply causation. Despite what the model may have learned, we can't argue based on the model that if you drive a Toyota, you're more likely to end up in an accident in the snow. The model learned that correlation, but there's actually another underlying reason for it. So we would like to create causal reasoning there. We would like to construct a reasonable explanation that makes sense where each step follows the next. But what's actually happening in deep learning systems is the identification of tons and tons of correlations. It's quite likely that in this web of correlations, the true causations are a subset. They're there, but it's really hard to tell them apart from false correlations or what are called spurious correlations. You just can't know. To make matters worse, a lot of AI systems will exhibit bias. For example, there was a judicial AI system in the US which labeled African Americans at high risk for repeat offenses twice as frequently as it labeled white people as high risk. That was a false correlation. The risk of being a repeat offender is probably a lot more due to personality and economic circumstances. But that was a correlation that was present in the model's training data, so it was something that it picked up on. Also, when the big tech companies started to come out with facial recognition technology, every single company was less accurate at identifying women and people people of non-white races at the beginning. And again, this was just because their training data originally had a lot more people of white men in it. I have a fun personal example. I was working with someone whose last name correlated with what people were saying in spam messages. So eventually, Microsoft's spam filters started flagging every message sent by this individual as spam. If the exact same message was sent by somebody else with a different name, it would go through. And this individual didn't have a lot of recourse because Microsoft's spam filters are basically a big machine learning model which they retrain periodically but which they don't have a lot of visibility into or explainability for why it would do certain predictions. Side note on combating bias, there's two main ways to do it. You can pre-process the training data, for example, to produce a representation that doesn't include the sensitive attribute that you're trying to protect, but that requires you to know what that attribute is at training time. And you can also do it in a post-processing step transforming the model's predictions after they're made. That is less ideal. And slightly fancier approaches would be to impose fairness constraints or use some adversarial learning. Adversarial learning is actually really good to break spurious correlations because it will generate a lot of data to try to trick the model. And if the model has a false impression about the world, it will get tricked and therefore corrected at training time. 
Part two, explainable decision-making. Let's start with a definition, or two actually. Interpretability and explainability. Interpretability refers to a model is interpretable if developers can dive into its training architecture and understand what makes its decisions tick. So interpretability is all about understanding technically what's happening inside the model. In contrast, explainability is all about users. A model is explainable if you can provide insight into why it made its decision at a level that is relevant to the end user that will build trust by the end user in the model. You might ask, what makes a good explanation? It basically boils down to explanations have to be causal, not correlations. Users want actual reasoning that makes sense. They're not going to be convinced by, it's sunny outside, so it must be Sunday. Explainable AI, or XAI, is actually a whole field on its own, as you might imagine. There is a class of algorithms called explainable AI algorithms. Generally speaking, simpler AI algorithms, like decision trees, are explainable, whereas machine learning and deep learning are not explainable. And if something is not explainable, it's called a black box algorithm. You can run the algorithm, you can give it some inputs and get output, but you don't know why it made that decision. It's a black box. You can't see inside it. And going back to the definition of explainability, you really want end users to have insight into the decisions so that they will start to trust the model. Explainable AI is really important for a lot of reasons. It's one of the best ways to combat bias in the training data, and it helps avoid unaligned AI systems, which means it's really good for AI safety. In addition to explainable, you might also see the terms justifiable and accountable. Justification basically lets you link to morality so that you can say whether or not the AI is making moral decisions. And accountability basically talks about can you blame the AI system if it makes a mistake? We'll talk more about that in a moment. It's actually funny to compare these concepts with how humans make decisions. If a human makes a decision and you ask them, why did you make that decision? Most people will probably be able to come up with an explanation, but according to cognitive psychology, the way that we do it is by generating a post hoc explanation after the fact. The justification for our decision doesn't have anything to do with how our brain actually came up with that decision. So the explanation might not be the true explanation. In other words, your brain may have made a decision because of some inherent biases, but when asked, why did you make that decision? You might come up with a perfectly reasonable explanation and not realize that your thinking is flawed. Humans spend like 25% of their lifetime in childhood, which is a really long time amongst mammals in general. And during this time, we're undergoing constant supervised learning and a fair amount of unsupervised learning as well. And everyone has to go through this process before you grow up and become a moral agent in society. And this process helps you train your brain to figure out, this is how I want to think. This is actually a good explanation for what I'm thinking. This is an emotional justification for what I'm thinking, etc. If you're going to trust a human to make decisions, there's usually certain things you want them to do. Within organizations, there's a concept called the RACI matrix or RACI framework, R-A-C-I. And yes, that's the most unfortunate name ever, but let's go into it. R-A-C-I stands for responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. If an organization is delegating some decision-making ability to a person, that person might check one or more of those four boxes. If you're responsible for something, it means that you're actually going out and implementing it yourself. If you're supposed to go shovel the snow, then you're the one who's actually doing the shoveling. If you're accountable for the snow shoveling, then when it doesn't happen, you are the one who has to answer for it. You're the one who tries to shepherd the process along to make sure that everything is going smoothly. If you're consulted on a decision, it means that the decision doesn't proceed without first asking you, how do you think it should go? And finally, if you're informed about a decision, then it can happen asynchronously and you're just told after the fact. So these are the four types of skills that a person would have to have in order to be delegated decision-making authority within an organization. And although humans being moral agents can be responsible and accountable for decisions, the same can't be said of AI models. An AI model can be responsible for a decision because it actually outputs something and that's the decision that was taken, but it can't really be accountable for that decision. You can't really blame it when something goes wrong because the model may just have been relying on a spurious correlation. So it's quite difficult to make a model that can be accountable for its actions. Part three, achieving more trustworthy AI. We talked a lot about explainability, which is from the user's perspective, getting them to trust and understand what the model is doing. Let's take a moment to talk about interpretability techniques. The simplest way of interpreting a model, understanding what's happening on the inside, basically, is to create a proxy model that tries to make the same decisions as a black box model. You can use an interpretable architecture for the proxy model and use it for all predictions going forwards, but you're going to lose a lot of accuracy because generally black box models like deep learning systems can be more accurate. You could also 
also create an introspective model. This falls into the category of using AI to solve AI problems. You can basically take your target model, which is a black box model, and train another deep neural network to try to understand why something is happening. The introspective model can output an explanation for each answer, such as this bird is a Kentucky warbler because it is yellow correlative techniques like saliency maps. You can basically run back propagation as if you're doing training and look at the biggest changes that would happen. This highlights possible paths. It tells you which portions of the input are most important in this decision. However, this just tells you correlations. And again, there could be multiple correlations for a given decision, even amongst the correlations that the model has learned. So you can see like two paths through the neural network. You don't really know which of those two is the underlying reason that the model made its decision. So you can't do causal reasoning which is one of the main reasons for having an interpretable system. And then, of course, you can also have post hoc interpretability. This is just how humans are generating explanations. You rationalize a decision after it has been made, which is really subject to confirmation bias, of course, amongst lots of other problems. In the context of a model, you can perform small perturbations to the model weights until you see a decision flip. And that will tell you how close you were to the boundary between two decisions. How different did it have to be before the decision would change? As you might have guessed, interpretability is very technical. It's hard to describe because there are lots of techniques, some of which only work on certain models or have different limitations, etc. So that's all I'll say about interpretability in this video. There are other ways that you could try to achieve more trustworthy AI, though, other than just relying on interpretability. For example, you could do psychological analysis. It sounds silly, but I found a paper talking about how cognitive psychology can have some lessons for analyzing models and their trustworthiness. Basically, cognitive psychology has to probe people's minds as a black box. A psychologist can't peek inside the box. They can only operate from outside. They can run little experiments by asking things of the patient or of the individual. When all of this comes together, the psychologist is doing, according to the paper, causal inference by attempted falsification of a priori hypothesis. Why, yes, of course. What that basically means is instead of just trying to take your AI model and running it on a test suite or a benchmark and saying, well, it worked on all of these cases, the idea is to create experiments where you attempt to falsify other explanations for the behavior you're observing. You go out and look for alternative explanations and make sure that those explanations can have holes poked in them. So anyway, this paper suggests a technique for evaluating AI models based on what cognitive psychologists do. It's basically a three-step process. You document variations in behavior, then you infer the cause, try to figure out what the reason is, and you identify boundary conditions that you can actually test. So those are the three steps that psychologists are doing, but actually they say you should do a fourth step, which you can do on a model and not on a human, which is to toy with the brain. You can make informed attempts to alter the behavior of the model based on what you observed in the previous three steps. Anyway, I won't go into that more, but if you're interested, the link as always is in the description below. And the third way we'll talk about of achieving more trustworthy AI is to create algorithms that are more explainable. I found this example on Yoshua Benjo's website. He says, based on the way that we're training AI systems today, that, quote, the resulting neural networks could implicitly rely on a single theory among those that are compatible with the data. Hence, they are not safe. What he's saying, basically, is that you can have multiple correlations present in the data, which could create multiple theories about what is true in the world. And you don't know which of those theories the AI model has decided to latch onto and believe, which is not at all safe, right? It's not aligned with humanity. Because if you have an erroneous explanation for the world and you follow that to some of its extremes, you could end up very far away from what humans would consider moral. So what could you do about this? Well, you could create a new algorithm that doesn't basically pick a random explanation amongst the ones that make sense from the data. There's a training mechanism called Bayesian inference. Conceptually, you list out all the possible explanations or theories that could explain the training data. Then you keep only those explanations that have the highest posterior probabilities, which means that they're compatible with the data, but they're also simpler to express. This basically ensures that you're using Occam's razor. So the simplest explanation 
traditions are going to be kept around, and the more complicated ones are going to be discarded. This relies on computing posterior probabilities, which are very difficult to compute. But with the huge scale of neural networks these days, Yoshua Benjo thinks you can probably approximate those posterior probabilities. And in the end, you've represented causality much better than any existing mechanisms. The correlations are all still there, but you're only choosing amongst a subset of them, the ones that seem to be very likely given the facts that you know about the world already. So if you manage to train models based on Bayesian inference, then this type of model might be more trusted to scale beyond human capabilities because it's probably more aligned. So hopefully we'll see that type of system in the future or other more trustworthy systems like it. Finally, in conclusion, we talked about how AI systems are really looking for a lot of correlations and picking amongst them. There'll be a lot of correlations in the training data and it will pick a few of them to latch onto and that is how the model will work. Additionally, any biases in the training data are very likely to make their way into the final model. So these issues with correlations and biases mean that current AI systems are not particularly trustworthy. We talked about interpretable models and explainable models, where explainable models are, does this make sense to the user? Does it engender trust in the model? And we talked about the whole set of explainable AI algorithms. I think explainability research is actually really cool, by the way. Then we talked about different ways you could get AI to be more trustworthy. You could invest in interpretability. You could invest in different types of experimental techniques like those that cognitive psychologists would use. Or you could even lean on new maths and try to create new training methods that are by design better aligned with human values. If you liked this video, check out this previous one I made about alignment and how we could control super intelligence if that was something we wanted to do. It shares some themes with the video you just finished watching. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.